Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Jakub Asaynos. I will be taking you for this section of History 124, namely the Mineral Revolution. Please note that this is a two-part video series that aims to complement the readings I have made available on Blackboard. It does not replace it. Therefore, it is still necessary for you to go through the readings. My videos are merely a substitute for the lectures. Finally, I know this is not the most ideal way of contacting all of you, but I am hoping that it will be the most convenient way for you to learn. If you have any queries regarding this particular section of the course, please email me at jbesaidnote at ufh.ac.za, which is provided below. I trust you will enjoy this new form of teaching. So let's get started. Every day in the underground world of mines, thousands of men face hardship and danger to win the mineral wealth of the world. Tons and tons of rock are drilled and blasted to provide the minerals necessary to industry and commerce. Above this dark and hidden world rise the cities which its wealth has built. In August 2012, miners at the Lonman Platinum Mine at Marikana near Rustenburg embarked on wildcat strike action. The miners attempted to force their employers in agreeing on a pay increase from just over 4,000 Rand per month to 12,500 Rand. Violence soon erupted and between 12th and 14th of August, 10 people were killed, including 6 mine workers, 2 Lonman security guards and 2 South African police service members. This violence culminated in the shooting and killing of 34 mine workers by the police on the 16th of August. Another 78 miners were wounded following the shootings. It became known as the Marikana Massacre and was the most lethal use of force by South African security forces against civilians since 1976. The massacre sparked a wave of wildcat strikes along across the South African mining sector and is considered a seminal event in modern South Africa, occurring in a year which arguably was the most protest-filled year in the country since the end of apartheid. The mining industry today is such an integral part not only of South Africa's economy, but also in its socio-political makeup. But 160 years ago, such an industry did not exist. It would be pure chance that catapulted South Africa into a mineral revolution that would help shape it into the country it is today. This lecture series will show how the discovery of minerals beneath the soil transformed the land above it from an agricultural backwater to an industrialized state. This revolution would make some people rich whilst exploiting others. It would lead to renewed efforts of imperialism and war in southern Africa and would influence racist, segregationist and apartheid policies that form the social, economic and political landscapes of South Africa for the better part of the 20th century. This is the story of the Mineral Revolution. Now in 1866, the area known as Griqualand West was an unremarkable pocket of land situated north of the Orange River. It was boxed in between four political entities, the two Boer Republics of the Zuid Afrikaanse Republic, South African Republic or ZAR, to the northeast, and the Orange Free State 
to the east, as well as Bechuana land to the north and northwest, and the British controlled Cape Colony to the west and south. Rickland West was inhabited by a group of people who originated from intermarriage between the crew of the Cape Colony and Dutch colonists. They referred to themselves as bastards. In response to insurgent resistance from Ku and San people, the colonists readily conscripted the bastards into paramilitary organizations known as commandos. This ensured that the men became skilled in lightly armed mounted skirmish tactics. They were equipped with guns and horses, but many bastards chose to abandon the Cape Colonial Society and moved north beyond the Cape Frontier. This gradual exodus of disgruntled Dutch-speaking trained marksmen leaving the Cape created skilled groups of opportunists who harassed the indigenous populations along the length of the Orange River. These groups called themselves the Urlam. One of the most influential of these Urlam groups was the Griqua. In the 19th century, the Griqua controlled several political entities which were governed by captains, that for captain or leader, and the councils with their own written constitutions. Adam Koch I, the first captain of the Griqua, was originally a slave who had brought his own freedom. He led his people north from the interior of the Cape Colony to the area just beyond the borders of the colony, taking over lands previously controlled by San and Swana people. This area came to be called Griqualand West, and the territory was centered on its capital, Klaarwater, later renamed Griqua Stad or Griqua Town. The Griqua were semi nomadic people. So, while many of them settled and established farms, others remained nomadic, moving from one area to another depending on the seasons and availability of grazing land for their cattle. Later, Griqua captain Andres Waterboer took control of Griqualand West and founded the powerful Waterboer captains. In a treaty signed in 1834, the Cape Colony gave due recognition to Waterboer as an independent chief and agreed to pay him a salary of £100 a year for protecting the colonial frontier by warning the authorities of possible attacks and sending back fugitives. A similar treaty was signed in 1843 with Cork, who had established a statelet at the mission station of Philopolis to the east of Waterboer's territory. But Griqua lands were soon threatened by the arrival of hundreds of Boer immigrants known as Voortrekkers from the Cape Colony from 1835 onwards. The Philopolis area lay right in the path of the Voortrekkers and soon passed into the hands of Boer owners and became part of the newly established Boer Republic of the Orange Free State. The Griqua population there moved eastwards, establishing a new territory near Natal known as Griqualand East. Boer farmers also began to obtain farm leases in Waterboer's territory of Griqualand West, registering their titles in the Free State. To the northeast of Griqualand West was the Boer Republic of the ZAR, also known as the Transvaal. This area had formerly been occupied by various Bantu groups such as some Tswana groups as well as the Matabele after the Mfatkane. But when the Voortrekkers migrated northwards, these groups were removed either through the signing of treaties or through force. In 1848, Sir Harry Smith, the governor of the Cape Colony, attempted to reimpose authority over the Bourges by declaring the area north and south of the Vaal River as sovereign British territory. However, he was forced to reconsider his plan and on 17th of January 1852, the ZAR was established when the British and Boers signed the Sand River Convention Treaty, recognizing their independence in the region to the north of the Val River. The first president of the ZAR was Martinez Vessel Pretorius, elected in 1857. The capital was established at Pochestrum, but later moved to Pretoria. The parliament was called the Volksraad and had 24 members. In 1875, the ZAR's president Thomas Franz of Burgers planned to build an ambitious railway scheme from the ZAR linking it to the Indian Ocean. 
However, his plans were thwarted by the Bapedi leader, Sekukune, whose territory lay in the path of the proposed railway. The military campaign against Sekukune was a disaster for the Boers, and they never managed to defeat him. The British had wished to annex the ZAR because of its strong strategic position in Southern Africa. The defeat of the ZAR by Sekukune, as well as the fact that it was virtually bankrupt, gave the British an excuse to annex the Boer Republic on the 12th of April 1877 as the Transvaal colony. Thereafter, the British defeated Sekukune in 1879. But now with Sekukune out of the way, the Boers decided to reclaim the ZAR as an independent Boer Republic. On the 13th of December 1880, a triumvirate Boer council comprising of Paul Kruger, Piet Joubert and Pretorius was formed. They regarded the annexation as an act of aggression and resisted. Thus, on the 20th of December 1880, the first Boer War, as it came to be known, formally broke out. The British garrisons in the Transvaal were besieged, but only one fell to the Republican Boers. After quick successive defeats, British Prime Minister William Gladstone chose to make peace. The Peace Treaty, the Pretoria, the Pretoria Convention, was drawn up and signed between the British colonial authorities and the ZAR. Britain now referred to the territory as the Transvaal State, but the Volksrad regarded the old ZAR as having been restored. On the 27th of February 1884, the ZAR became fully independent with the signing of the London Convention. In early 1867, the first diamond was discovered by accident on the farm de Kalk on the northern frontier of the Cape Colony, immediately south of Griqualand West, owned by a poor boer named Daniel Jacobs. His son Erasmus picked up a funny looking stone close to the southern bank of the Orange River. A neighbor, Skalk van Nikak, saw the stone and, thinking that it might have some kind of value, offered to purchase it. Jacobs' wife told Van Niekerk that he could have the stone for free. However, Van Niekerk told her that if it turned out that it was a diamond, he would share the proceeds with the Jacobs. It was in fact a diamond and was later valued in London at £500, which was a fortune at the time. Despite this, the De Kalk diamond was seen as one of its kind and not much further interest was given to the discovery. Then, in March 1869, a Griqua farm worker brought Van Niekerk a large stone which he had found on the banks of the Orange River. Van Niekerk brought the diamond from the Griqua in exchange for 500 sheep, 10 oxen and a horse and then sold it to a diamond merchant in Hopetown for £11,200. The diamond would later be purchased in London for a whopping £25,000. In the rush that followed, hundreds of diggers moved into Griqualand West and settled on the diamond fields near the junction of the Vaal and Orange Rivers. A 12 km stretch of the Vaal was soon crowded with speculators and prospectors. Here they established brief settlements such as Dalport's Hope, Kaywood's Hope, Last Hope, Forlorn Hope, Fool's Rush, Midnight Rush, Winter's Rush and Poor Man's Copy. The digging was haphazard, with most diggers digging shallowly through sand and gravel in the belief that diamonds had been washed downstream. If they found nothing, they quickly moved to another site, but not many managed real success. About 30 kilometers south of the Vol River, Boer prospectors found diamonds in the natural basin or pan on the farm Dorsfontein, commonly called the Toys Pan, and owned by Adrian van Beek. Other discoveries were made on the nearby farm of Boltfontein, owned by Cornelis de Ploy. However, these sites yielded very little reward for the prospectors who tried their luck. The view at the time was that diamonds were alluvial deposits only, 
deposited downstream on and along the riverbeds as, diamonds, as diamond mining in India and Brazil had shown. Most diggers thus moved back to river sites. Van Veik sold the Toys Pond to merchant speculators for £2,600, while the Ploy sold Bultfontein for £2,000. However, unbeknownst to Van Veik or the Ploy, as well as the new owners, beneath these two farms lay two diamond pipes or necks of long extinct volcanoes that contained enormous pockets filled with diamonds. To the north of these two farms, on the farm for Eitzicht, occupied by Johannes Nicolaus de Beer and his brother Dedrick, were two more diamond pipes that also lay undiscovered with an even greater deposit of diamonds. Historian Martin Meredith notes in his book Diamonds, Gold and War, the three farms covering an area of about 58 square miles amounted to the most valuable piece of real estate in the world. Only at the end of 1870 did a new rush to the Toys Pun and Bultfontein erupt. Within weeks, hordes of prospectors flooded the area. In May 1871, diggers discovered one of the two pipes on Fort Eitzicht, not far from the De Beers farmhouse. Within two months, 10,000 men were working there. In July, a group of diggers from Colesburg found diamonds on a hill on Fort Eitzicht which they called Colesburg Kopi. The rush to Colesburg Kopi turned into a stampede as diggers from the Toys Pan, Boltfontein and the river diggings rushed to stake a claim there. Less than 20 years later, in 1886, Gold was discovered on the Witwalters Rand, also known as the Rand in the ZOR. There had been earlier gold discoveries in the ZOR in the 1870s and early 1880s, most notably in Ladenburg, Pilgrim's West, and Barberton. It is also argued that the first recorded discovery of gold on the Rand was actually in June 1884 by prospector Jan Gerrit Bankies. However, Historians generally agree that Bankies had only discovered a minor gold reef. It was on the farm Lange Laagte that the main reef of, gold, of large gold deposits was first discovered by a prospector called George Harrison. Harrison and a colleague George Walker were on their way to Barberton when they were offered work to build a cottage on Lange Laagte for Boer Widow. In April 1886, Harrison and Walker signed a contract with the Oosthuizen family which allowed them to prospect for gold on the farm. In May, Harrison hurried to Pretoria, the capital city of the ZAR, to obtain a prospecting license. He took with him a sample of gold-bearing rock which he showed to the ZAR president Paul Kruger. Harrison was given the name Zucker, which means seeker or discovery of the find and awarded free claim. But Harrison decided to sell his claim for £10. What Harrison did not know, however, was that the richest gold field ever discovered lay beneath his feet. A diamond consists of an intricate makeup of carbon atoms that make it the hardest and robust mineral on earth. As a result, Diamonds today are crucial in the manufacture of high-tech cutting, grinding and polishing tools. But for centuries, diamonds have been highly valued as a luxury item, more than just a jewelry accessory, but also a status symbol. Diamonds are available in quantities that most other gems fail to come anywhere near, but the operating costs, labor and the skills that go into producing even the smallest polished diamond mean that prices reflect an individual gem's luxury status. The weight and purity of diamonds are measured in carats. Thus, generally speaking, the more the carats, the more valuable the stone. The value placed on diamonds meant that the discovery of diamonds in Grukeland West initiated a frantic rush. 
Diamond fever gripped Southern Africa and thousands of shopkeepers, tradesmen, clerks and farmers set out to the diamond fields of Greco and West in search of untold riches. Some went by ox wagon or mule cart, while others travelled by foot, walking from as far as Cape Town that lay approximately 1,130 kilometres away. They were joined by a diverse array of prospectors from around the world, seasoned diggers from the Australian gold fields, miners from California, traders from England, Irish dissidents, German speculators, deserters, disgraced lawyers and doctors. As one diamond, healer one diamond dealer remarked, each postcard and bullock wagon brought its load of sordid, impecunious humanity. In the early days following the discovery in Griqualand West, diggers found diamonds very close to the surface. This meant that a poor speculator can become rich overnight. According to Meredith, a day's work for those in luck could provide them with as many as 10 or 20 diamonds. Some made their fortunes before breakfast. For example, one penniless Englishman found a 175 carat diamond valued at 33,000 pounds. With every big discovery on the diamond fields, enthusiasm was reignited among the rest of the diggers. The feeling was that their moment of striking it lucky was just around the corner. However, as time passed, the mining settlements of Griqualand West came to be renowned not only for the fortunes that were made there, but also for despair, disease and death. Conditions at the settlements were unimaginably awful. New arrivals to the digging sites were immediately struck by the stench and squalor as they approached the mining sites. The side of the roads leading to the camps were full of carcasses of pack animals left to rot. Toilets were in fact open trenches dug in the ground. As a result, flies were everywhere. Frederick Boyle, a visitor from England who had arrived in November 1871, wrote about the flies. Dishes and drink choked with them. The air was thick with dust due to the constant digging and shifting of dirt that went on from morning until evening. Shortage of water meant that most diggers were unable to wash. In summer, the Griqualand West was boiling hot, and in winter, the nights were icy cold. When the rains came, dysentery hit the camps and killed or inca incapacitated many diggers. Moreover, despite all these sufferings, diggers were not guaranteed any riches. In fact, most of the time, the rewards never came. Hundreds of claims were abandoned every month as diggers ran out of money to pay the required license fee. Everything depended on luck. Still, new arrivals continued to descend upon the diamond fields of Griqualand West. One of them was a 17-year-old Englishman called Cecil John Rhodes. Suffering from weak health since a child, it was thought that sending him to a better climate, climate in Southern Africa would help improve his health. Thus, Rhodes was sent from England to the British colony of Natal to join his brother in a cotton farming venture there. Initially, Rhodes was not as enthusiastic to the diamond fever that gripped the rest of Natal. He wrote, Of course there's a chance of the diamonds turning out trumps, but I don't count much from them. You see, it's all chance. However, his brother decided to take his chances and set out for Griqualand West in search of fortune. A year later, in October 1871, Rhodes followed him there. He set out on horseback with some possessions loaded on an ox wagon. Griqualand West lay 645 kilometers away. Along the way, his horse died, so he continued the trip on foot. After more than a month, Rhodes arrived at the Toys Pun, one of the farms where the new diamond rush started. This place, this place had helped start the mineral revolution and it would also be the place that would make Cecil John Rhodes one of the richest men in the world. However, fortune did not come overnight. In fact, a crisis gripped the diamond field in January 1872. 
The enormous output of diamond production flooded the diamond market which led to a sudden collapse in the price of rough diamonds in London. This prompted diamond buyers on the fields to close down. Boyle described an interaction he witnessed between a diamond buyer and two diggers. One of the main diggers produced a tin box wrapped in a scrap of rag. Inside were four diamonds, a spotless stone of 15 carats and three fine white chips weighing together 10 carats, the result perhaps of weeks of weary labour. He asked 50 pounds for them, but the buyer declined to make an offer. If I can't get 50 pounds for all my sweat and the health I've lost, I'll just pitch them stones into the vault, the digger said, and left this consulate. Boyle himself decided to leave after suffering a series of misfortunes. He left Griqualand West convinced that diamond digging was about striking it lucky, and only a few were afforded that luck. In October 1871, Wickland West was annexed by Britain. Under British rule, diggers continued to have mixed fortunes. Diggers had struck blue ground, the hard rock under the surface of the so-called yellow ground. It was feared that this meant the end for diamond mining. But the blue ground was found to decompose quite quickly once exposed to weather. It was also found to contain an even greater density of diamonds than yellow ground. But as the mines went deeper into the ground, the hazards grew. Diggers would mine for diamonds without any sort of support, often more than 25 meters below ground level. Roadways linking the bottom of the pits to the top of the mine regularly collapsed, which led to di diggers and their claims buried under tons of soil. Despite these hazards, Rhodes persevered at Colesburg Kopi, or New Rush, as it later became known. Despite his antisocial behaviour, Rhodes struck up several lasting friendships with other white English prospectors on New Rush. One of these friendships was with Charles Rudd, with whom he would enter into a close business partnership. Neither Rhodes nor Rudd enjoyed the business of digging. Rudd would complain later to a friend of the hard labour he and Rush, he and Rhodes endured, carrying pay dirt in bags, bo boxes to the sorting table when black African labour was scarce. Despite the wealth he was accumulating from diamonds, Rhodes still longed for a university education. Thus, in July 1873, he left his business interests in the hands of Rudd and left for England with the intention of gaining admission to Oxford University. Before his departure for Oxford, he and Rudd moved from Colesburg Kopi to invest in the costlier claims of what was known as Old De Beers on Voor Eitzicht. From late 1873 to 1875, the diamond fields were once again in the grip of a crisis in the form of an economic depression due to a severe drought and another sharp fall in diamond prices. But Rhodes and Rudd were among those who stayed to consolidate their interests. Rhodes returned from Oxford for after only one term in 1873, but would go back to continue his studies in 1876. Since digging diamonds on a larger scale was virtually impossible for individuals, small claim holders soon merged into larger ones. Moreover, Equipment for digging, hauling the dirt up and pumping water out of the mines was purchased or rented by groups of miners, who were forced to cooperate even more intensively. Rhodes and Rudd were some of the first businessmen to rent out pumping equipment and soon realized that he had tapped into a vast market potential. They reinvested the initial proceeds from equipment rental in acquiring claims. By 1880, he and Rudd built an up a syndicate with the second largest holding at the De Beers mine. As a result, they held a large enough share of diamond claims to justify a separate company purely concerned with managing the mines. On the 1st of April 1880, Rhodes and Rudd launched a joint stock company and named it De Beers Mining Company. By 1887, the company was the sole owner of South African diamond mines. 
Meanwhile, with the coming of British rule na names of places were duly changed. The colonial secretary, Lord Kimberley, complained he could neither spell for Aitzacht, nor did he consider New Rush to be a decent name given to the new colonies, to the newest of colonies of the British Crown. Accordingly, a proclamation was made declaring that the settlement previously known as Vur Aitzacht Farm, as well as Colesburg Kopi or New Rush, was renamed the town of Kimberley. By 1873, Kimberley was fast growing into the second largest town in southern Africa, with a population of approximately 13,000 whites and 30,000 black Africans, with the toys pun adding a further 6,000 people to the total population. Similar to the discovery of diamonds, the discovery of gold at the Witwatersrand was slow to get off the mark. In 1886, the new industry of gold mining produced only 0.16% of the world's total gold output, with Australia and America still being the top global producers of gold. However, by 1898, the Witwatersrand was producing 27% of the gold's gold of the world's gold. By 1913, it was producing no less than 40% of the world's gold output. Massive sums of capital were being invested in the gold mines of the, of the Rand. In 1890, the average value of capital invested in those mines stood at 22 million pounds. By 1899, this figure had more than tripled to 75 million pounds. By 1914, it rocketed to 125 million pounds. This dramatic turn meant that the ZAR was able to go from a purely agricultural economy to an industrial one in a relatively short period of scarcely 30 years. The entire length of the gold reef ran across the Rand for more than 60 kilometers, marked with what is described as all the signs of an industrial, of an industrial revolution. The area was filled with a frenzy of humanity and technology. Mining headgear, ore dumps, slime dams, and railway lines leading to and from the rapidly increasing number of mines. Towns and mining compounds popped up seemingly overnight to accommodate the thousands of black and white miners who made their way to the new gold fields. While all of these developments were unfolding, lay what Charles von Onsen calls the social, political and economic nerve centre of the new order. This nerve centre was, was the newly established city of Johannesburg. Meanwhile, as the process of colonial conquest and dispossession was completed over the second half of the 19th century, black Africans lost the possibility of farming independently, either on communal land or as individual peasants. Although a new and successful class of peasant farming emerged briefly, government laws and practices were imposed to destroy that peasantry and create a rural proletariat or working class. The final outcome was that for the black African populations of southern Africa, land was scarce but the availability of black African labor became abundant. As soon as white colonialists controlled the land in any area, they were able to exercise a much greater degree of power over the supply of labor. According to Charles H. Feinstein, in the mid-19th century, the white colonialist requirements were still fairly modest. There was some commercial farming, with wheat, wine and fruit in the Cape, wool in the Cape and Orange Free State, sugar in the Tull. But the extent of cultivation on most European farms in the interior was very limited. From the 1850s, as the economic development of the Cape gathered pace with the expansion of wool exports, the need for additional workers also quickened and was then dramatically transformed, first by the expansion of the diamond mining operations and later by the growth of gold mining on the Rand. The diamond rush attracted a steady flow of black African migrants from across southern Africa. Many of them travelled for weeks by foot to get to the diamond fields, arriving there exhausted and starving. The largest number of, these of the Bapedi men 
came from Pelyland, more than 800 kilometers away from Kimberley. They were encouraged by Sekukune to earn money with the goal of purchasing guns. Tsonga migrants walked from the Gaza territory north of the Limpopo River, presently in Mozambique, which was almost 1,600 kilometers away. Zulu men arrived from Zululand and Natal, while Basutu men also embarked on the journey to the diamond fields. Meredith estimates that the diamond mine grew, drew more than 50,000 black Africans annually during the early 1870s. Most stayed for periods of between three and six months, working as laborers for white diggers or finding other work in the camps. They usually earned about 10 shillings a week and a further 10 shillings in the form of food, returning home once they had saved enough cash to buy cattle or a gun. An old muzzle-loading infield discarded by the British Army could be bought for £3. Between April 1873 and June 1874, some 75,000 guns were sold in Kimberley alone. White diggers frequently complained about black African labor, resorting frequently to abuse and violence. The Diamond News newspaper argued in 1872 that black labor was both the most expensive in the world and the most unmanageable. With 5,000 independent diggers in need of their services, black African laborers were able to move from one claim to the next in search of the higher pay or better employer. It was a simple fact that without labor, the diggers faced ruin. So diggers regularly demanded stricter measures with which to control the movement and freedoms of black African laborers and prevent them from leaving their employer. Preventative measures included linking the desertion of the employees with diamond theft. The problem of diamond theft started to become prevalent from 1872 onwards. Large quantities of stolen diamonds were smuggled out of the camps and sold in coastal towns or foreign markets. Whites, as well as blacks, were involved in this illegal trade. Rough justice was meted out to both whites and blacks accused or suspected of involvement. In dealing with whites, the routine punishment usually adopted was for a group of vigilante miners to confront their culprit before setting fire to his tent, shop, or canteen, destroying all his property and then expelling him. In dealing with blacks, the usual punishment was flogging, beating or whipping them with a stick or whip. In addition, the overt racist attitudes of white diggers led to resentment at the way some black African and colored people had managed to establish themselves as claim holders or share workers managing claims in return for a percentage of the profits. Absurdly, white diggers maintained that only black African diggers possessing the right to sell diamonds acted as go-betweens for the illegal trafficking of diamonds. In March 1872, white residents of Kimberley demanded new laws that would allow them to control and regulate black African and colored workers. They wanted all employees, but particularly black African and colored employees, to enter into written contracts that were registered with government officials. They also demanded that these employees be searched at any time and be restricted by a nighttime curfew. They also wanted a ban imposed that prevented black Africans and coloreds from holding a digging license unless supported by 50 white claim holders. In the following months, they resorted to increasingly violent protest actions, burning tents of black African claim holders and attempting to lynch blacks suspected of stealing diamonds. An example of the racist and exploitative attitudes of the diggers came in July 1872, when a white digger flogged two of his black African workers, accusing them of diamond theft. And then he left them naked and bound in the open air on a winter's night, causing the death of one of them. The digger was brought before the magistrate's court and was found guilty by the jury of common assault only, which, it was said, was committed under great provocation. Kimberley residents were shocked 
that the magistrate sentenced him to six months hard labor without the option of a fine. This was because up until then, crimes of violence against blacks had rarely been punished and even then, sentences had been limited to small fines. The Diamond Field newspaper argued that the sentence had done more to defeat the ends of justice than uphold the dignity of the law, supposedly for being so harsh against a white digger. Faced with increasing disorder, the British colonial authorities agreed to most of the diggers' demands. Proclamation 14 of August 1872 laid down a new regime for labor contracts linking it to a system of past laws, something that had a long history in Southern Africa, even before then. For instance, from 1760 onwards, every slave moving between town and country had to carry a pass signed by his or her master, and in 1797, the Swellendam authorities required that all Hottentots, or Ku, moving about the country for any purpose should carry passes. This was extended as a central feature of the system created by Lord Caledon in 1809, under which no coup could move anywhere without any official pass. These pass laws would be refined and adapted for the mineral mines, becoming the main device for controlling black labor throughout southern Africa for decades to come. Proclamation 14 used the terminology of masters and servants. Upon their arrival in Kimberley, black African migrants or servants were required to register themselves and obtain a daily pass until they had secured employment. The labor contract showed the name of the servant, his wages, period of service and the name of his master. Once employed, the servant was required to carry a pass signed by his master. According to the proclamation, any person who shall be found wandering or loitering about within the precincts of any camp without a pass and without being able to give a good and satisfactory account of himself was liable to a five pound fine or imprisonment for up to three months or flogging. Masters were entitled to search the person, his residence or property of their servants at any time without a warrant. In theory, the law was impartial applying equally to all servants or employees regardless their skin color, but in reality it applied only to black Africans and coloreds. The concessions made by the British authorities did not soften the attitudes of the white diggers who continued to complain of high tax impositions and so-called black disorder. These attitudes eventually contributed to the so-called black flag or diggers revolt in Kimberley in 1875. The revolt signified a watershed moment as it represented a clear victory for white interests above all others. The same pattern of black Africans seeking employment was evident on the gold mines of the Witwatersrand. From the 1890s, demand for labor accelerated with the expansion of gold mining operations. Agriculture was actually still the dominant employer but from now on it faced serious competition for labor from the mines. By 1911, some 260,000 Africans were employed on gold and other mines compared to 360,000 on commercial white-owned farms. The labor force in the gold fields incorporated three key features first developed on the diamond mines. Firstly, occupations were rigidly demarcated into skilled labor which was exclusively reserved for highly paid white workers while manual work was performed solely by low paid black workers. Secondly, a black African workforce that was recruited as short term migrants. And thirdly, the housing of black Africans in closed compounds. The gold mine owners quickly understood that the fundamental requirement for profitable operations was the recruitment of large numbers of black Africans at low wages. In 1897, George Elbu, chairman of the Association of Mines, explained to a commission of inquiry how he proposed to cheapen labor by simply telling the boys that their wages are reduced. This meant a reduction of a third of their wages from two shillings three pence per shift to one shilling six pence for skilled labor. 
The following is an exchange between Albu and the Commission of Inquiry. It reveals Albu's views quite explicitly, albeit crassly. I have replaced the offensive terms with more acceptable terminology. However, this exchange still offers incredible insight on how mine owners viewed the black African labor issue. Commission Suppose the blacks retire back to their kraals. Would you be in favor of asking the government to enforce labor? Albu Certainly. I would make it compulsory. Why should a black be allowed to do nothing? I think a black should be compelled to work in order to earn his living. Commission If a man can live without work, how can you force him to work? Albu Tax him then. Commission Then you would not allow a black to hold land in the country, but he must work for the white man to enrich him? Albu He must do his part of the work of helping his neighbors. Thus, mechanisms such as taxation, pass laws, masters and servants acts, the extension of credit by traders and rural poverty played an essential role in securing men for the mines. In 1895, the Chamber of Mines drafted a law designed to give it greater control over the labor that had been recruited. They persuaded the folks around to pass the law, which required a black African in a proclaimed labor district to obtain a pass that would be held by his employer until he was discharged. Anyone found without a pass could be arrested. This law was difficult to administer and was soon replaced by a system under which the pass laws made breach of contract by black Africans a criminal offense. Immediately following the establishment of union in South Africa in 1910, the Native Labor Regulation Act of 1911 continued the system that had operated in the old ZAR, making the breach of contract provisions of the Masters and Servants, specific, uh, Masters and Servants Acts specifically applicable to any black African laborers employed on the mines. As a result of these penal sanctions for breach of contract, any strike action by black African mine workers was made illegal. A similar breach of contract by a white worker was not a crime and only subject to civil law penalties. The act also made all black Africans working on the mines subject to the past laws. This was both a further means of preventing desertion and the system of identification that restricted their ability to move freely about the country. Crucially, by preventing black Africans from entering urban areas, it left mining and farming as the only alternative employment. Thus, the subsequent pass laws and influx controls favored these sectors at the expense of manufacturing. While this was the general context for the creation of a mine labor force, its recruitment was distinguished by a number of more specific interrelated features, all established early in the history of the industry. All black African miners were recruited on a temporary basis as migrant labor. The usual contract was for 12 to 18 months and for the duration of the contract they were prohibited from seeking for of taking up any other job. Whilst in the mines they were housed and fed in large single sex compounds and at the end of their contract, uh, contracted period they were required to go back to the area from which they had come. The combination of fixed term contracts, penal sanctions and controlled compounds gave the companies great power over their workers and minimized the possibility of trade unions or political organization. With the influx of prospectors into Griqua territory near the junction of the Vol and Orange rivers, a threat to Griqua autonomy had arisen. This was land through which the Griqua regularly moved with their herds, but it was also situated partly on land claimed by both the Griqua leader, Nicholas Waterboer, as well as by the Boer Republic of the Orange Free State. In addition, ZR President Pretorius declared the diamond fields as Boer property and established a temporary government over the diamond fields in 1870, even though the river diggings lay well outside of ZAR borders. Pretoria sent mounted police and a magistrate to the north bank of the Vol to show how serious he was. 
The diggers themselves were divided between supporters of the ZAR's claims and those who favoured self-rule. Tension quickly grew between these parties until Stafford Parker, a former British sailor, organised a faction of the diggers to drive all of the ZAR officials out of the area. On the 30th of July 1870, at the mining settlement of Clipdrift, Stafford Parker declared the independent Clipdrift Republic, also known as the Diggers Republic, and was also chosen as its president. Clipdrift was promptly renamed Parkerton after its new president, who began to collect, st collect taxes, often at gunpoint. By December 1870, about 10,000 British settlers made their home in the new republic. During the following year, Boer forces unsuccessfully attempted to regain the territory through negotiation. In February 1871, while on a tour of the Diamond Fields, the newly attempted British High Commissioner and Governor of the Cape, Sir Henry Barclay, quickly realised that the very issue of political leadership in Southern Africa hung in the balance. British interest in the diamond fields had grown significantly since the diamond rush. Cape colonial officials welcomed the prospect of a new source of income and economic activity that, that the diamond trade would bring to the impoverished Cape colony. But they were also concerned about the territorial ambitions of the Orange Free State and the ZAR, now that diamonds had been discovered close to their territories. Griqualand and in particular the diamond-rich Campbelllands lay across the only so-called road to the north, still outside the, Bo the two Boer republics that colonial hunters and traders used to gain access to the interior of Africa. Traders and hunters sold guns and ammunition in exchange for ivory, ostrich feathers and animal hides worth £75,000 a year. The sheer volume of this trade with the interior was substantial. Thus, there was a danger that if the Orange Free State acquired the Campbell lands, the road to the north and its trade would be lost. Furthermore, British dominance in the region would be threatened by the growing power of the two Boer republics. Therefore, Barkey was committed to support Walter Boer's claims to the diamond fields, regardless of their merit, to ensure the supremacy of British interests. To decide the matter of ownership, Barclay proposed arbitration by the governor of Natal, Robert Keat, and so the Keat Commission was set up. After considerable wrangling, Pretorius accepted the proposal, but Orange Free State President Johannes Brandt insisted on independent foreign arbitration and refused to participate. In September 1871, Keat ruled in favour of Waterboer's claims, and Waterboer immediately asked Barclay to take over the territory. Without waiting for approval from London, Barclay proclaimed the annexation of Griqualand West on 27 October 1871, not by the Cape Colony, but in the name of the British Crown. Griqualand's eastern border with the Orange Free State was realigned to ensure that the whole of the diamond fields fell within its jurisdiction. Meanwhile, Colonial Secretary, the Earl of Kimberley, was fuming that Barclay had annexed Griqualand West as a political as a British colony without waiting until arrangements could be made for its incorporation into the Cape Colony. Kimberley later wrote, I never doubted that Sir Henry Barclay made a mistake in annexing the diamond fields before the Cape Par Parliament had passed the bill. He exceeded these instructions and departed from the line of policy which I believe would have succeeded but which requires more patience than he seems to possess. However, we had no alternative but to approve his conduct. Resentment about, the Britain, about Britain's annexation of Griqualand festered in the Boer republics for years. In the ZAR, the Volksrat blamed Pretorius for accepting arbitration in the first place and forced his resignation. They subsequently refused to consider itself bound by Keats' award. In Bloemfontein, the Free State's capital city, Brandt and his government issued a counter-proclamation and continued the protest year after year at the dispossession of territory he considered rightfully belonged to the Free State. In fact, 
When the annexation took place, a party in the Orange Free State Volksrat wanted to respond by going to war with Britain. But Brandt's advisers convinced him to avert war by any and all means. As an offering to the Orange Free State, the British government eventually agreed in 1876 to make payment of £90,000, but the issue still irritated the Boer Republic for years to come and renewed feelings of distrust between the Boers and the British. In 1877, the same year that Britain annexed the ZAR, the 24-year-old Rhodes was busy with his second full year of study at, Ro at Oxford. While there, he drew up a document he titled Confession of Faith. This document would reflect his own beliefs of the importance that British imperialism brought to the world. Now before we continue, let us briefly look at what imperialism in general means. Imperialism can be defined as the policy or ideology of extending the rule or authority of an empire or nation over foreign countries or of acquiring and holding colonies and dependencies for the purpose of extending political and economic access. In other words, it promotes either through policy or ideology the idea that one state is superior to others and thus has the authority to rule over those states for the purposes of its own political and economic growth. This is achieved through the power of control by employing so-called hard power, like the use of military force, as well as convincing an entity to cooperate and collaborate through non-coercive means, also known as soft power. Imperialism is therefore a form of colonialism, but is also a distinct system that can apply to other forms of expansion and many other systems of government. So now that we have an idea of what imperialism is, let's return to Rhodes and his Confession of Faith. The document echoed his interest in works of authors he admired, such as the ancient writers Aristotle and Marcus Aurelius, but it also shows Rhodes was influenced by two more recent publications. One of these was an inaugural lecture by Professor John Ruskin of Oxford, delivered in 1870. In his lecture, Ruskin spoke of the imperial ideals. He said the following, There is a destiny now possible to us, the highest ever set before a nation to be accepted or refused. We are still undegenerate in race, a race mingled with the best northern blood. We are not yet dissolute in temper, but still have the firmness to govern and the grace to obey. Will you youths of England make your country again a royal throne of kings, accepted isle for all the world, a source of light, a centre of peace, mistress of learning and the arts, faithful guardian of time-tried principles? This is what England must either do or perish. She must found colonies as fast and as far as she is able, formed of her most energetic and worthiest men, seizing every piece of fruitful waste grounds she can set her foot on and there teaching the, these her colonists that their chief virtue is to be fidelity to their country and their first aim is to be to advance the power of England by land and sea. All that I ask of you is to have a fixed purpose of some kind for your country and for yourselves, no matter how restricted so that it be fixed and unselfish. Rhodes not only embraced Ruskin's call, but wished to pledge himself to the British imperialist cause when he wrote in his Confession of Faith, It often strikes a man to inquire what is the chief good in life. To one the thought comes that it is a happy marriage, to another great wealth, to a third travel, and so on. And as each seizes on, his, on the idea for that he more or less works for its attainment for the rest of, it, of his existence. To myself, thinking over the same question, the wish came to make myself useful to my country. Rhodes continued, I contend that we are the first race in the world, and that the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for the human race. I contend that every acre added to our territory means the birth of more of the English race 
who otherwise would not be brought into existence. Added to which the absorption of the greater portion of the world under our rule simply means the end of all wars. In other words, Rhodes saw it as his responsibility, as part of the first race, to expand the influence of the English race across the rest of the world for its own benefit. His rationale was that if the entire world was under English rule, or at least English influence, then there would be no need for war. He further pledged to work for bringing the whole uncivilized world under British rule for the making of the Anglo-Saxon race into one empire. He lamented particularly at the loss of the United States of America after the country's war of independence against Britain in the second half of the 18th century. But there was still Africa. Rhodes wrote, Africa is still lying ready for us. It is our duty to take it. More territory simply means more of the Anglo-Saxon race, more of the best, the most human, most honorable race the world possesses. Later that year, while in Kimberley, Rhodes drew up a will wherein he nominated the colonial secretary at the time, Lord Carnarvon, as well as Attorney General of Griqualand West, Sidney Shippard, as executors to his estate. He instructed them to establish a secret society with the aim and purpose of extending British rule throughout the world, the perfecting of a system of emigration from the United Kingdom and colonization by British subjects of all lands, especially by the occupation by British settlers of the entire continent of Africa. Rhodes gradually dropped his ambition of pursuing a professional career as his business interests began to flourish. Alongside his business ambition, Rhodes started to channel his ambition towards politics. At around the same time, the British government was furthering its own imperialist ambitions in Southern Africa. British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli proudly considered himself an imperialist and surrounded himself with like-minded men such as Colonial Secretary Lord Carnarvon. Carnarvon was preoccupied with imperial defence. He regarded the Cape and its naval facilities at Simons Bay, today Simons Town, as the most important link in the imperial network outside Britain itself, upon which the safety of the entire empire might one day depend. It needed to be maintained at all hazards and irrespective of cost. Strategic considerations overrode financial concerns. Furthermore, the Cape provided a, a vital commercial link. Despite the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869, a seventh of all British trade annually still passed the Cape. In the event of war affecting the Mediterranean and the Suez Canal, the Cape route would become even more important. However, Carnarvon was concerned with the so-called chaos that threatened the British colonies from within the interior of Southern Africa. Apart from the three separate British colonies and the two Boer republics, Southern Africa consisted of numerous African polities, most notably the Amatwasa, the Amazulu, the Swazi, the Baperi, the Tswana and the Basutu. It was a region where, ter where territorial boundaries were ill-defined and armed conflict seemed to be rampant. Carnarvon was particularly alarmed at the ZAR's attempts to expand eastwards towards the coast. As we have seen earlier, ZAR President Burgers attempted to build an ambitious railway line to the Portuguese territory of Delago Bay. This would enable the ZAR to be commercially independent of British colonial ports and break away from British domination. Carnarvon was convinced that the Cape's security could not be assured unless the interior was secured. Thus, Britain tried to claim possession of Delago Bay itself, but failed when the matter was put to arbitration with Portugal. But this didn't deter Carnarvon. His plan was to construct a federation in Southern Africa, in other words, a joint partnership between all the groupings in the region that would serve as a bastion of the British Empire and protect both its strategic and commercial interests. Carnarvon argued that confederation would encourage the flow of European immigration and capital, provide a more effective administration at less expense, 
and reduce the likelihood of demands for aid in the form of money or troops. Furthermore, it would assist the development of an effective policy that would adequately address the so-called native question. However, there were very few willing accomplices for Carnarvon's scheme, especially from the Boer republics. But then, the ZAR was defeated by Segukune in a high-risk campaign against the Baperdi in the eastern parts of the ZAR. Segukune's army was fully equipped with guns, purchased by petty, by petty migrant laborers from the wages they had earned on the diamond fields at Kimberley. This greatly enhanced Segukune's force. The Boers were also unable to penetrate the Baperdi capital, Tsate, which was well fortified in the Lulu Mountains. As a result, the demoralized Boer army was soon driven out of Sekukune's territory. Carnarvon saw this as the perfect opportunity to push his imperialist agenda. With Disraeli's permission, he appointed committed imperialist Theophilus Shepston to act as special commissioner to the ZAR. In secret, he was given instructions to annex the ZAR if a sufficient number of its residents were willing or even if they were not willing and to install himself as the first British governor of the Transvaal colony. In the meantime, Carnarvon appointed Sir Bartle Frere as High Commissioner and Governor of the Cape. Frere shared Carnarvon's vision of federation and thus was given a lot more powers than his predecessors to achieve their goal of establishing a Southern African confederation that was firmly under British control. But Carnarvon's ambition did not stop there. He began to fashion the idea of a Cape to Cairo policy that would later be adopted by Rhodes, envisaging even greater tracts of African territories coming under British control, out of reach of other European powers. In a letter to Frere on 12th December 1876, he wrote, I should not like anyone to come too near us, either on the south towards the Transvaal, which must be ours, or on the north, too near to Egypt and the country which belongs to Egypt. In fact, when I speak of geographical limits, I am not expressing my real opinion. We cannot admit rivals in the east or even the central parts of Africa, and I do not see why, looking, for, looking to the experience that we have now of English life within the tropics, the Zambezi should be considered to be without the range of our colonization. Carnarvon achieved the first leg of this grand vision when the ZAR was eventually annexed by Britain after Shepston convinced Burgers that the military and financial position of the ZAR was untenable. On 12 April 1877, the ZAR became a British colony known as the Transvaal Colony. But as we have seen, this was short-lived. Republican Boer bitterness towards the annexation led to resistance and eventually war, with the Boer leader Paul Kruger, or Kruger emerging as president of the newly independent ZAR in 1883. This was not the only setback to the British imperialist plans for confederation. Blind ambition and arrogance of imperialist ideology would lead to disaster for the British at Isandwana in 1879 and open rebellion by the Basutu during the so-called Gun War of 1880 to 1881. Meanwhile, Rhodes was busy pursuing a, polit a political career and with the incorporation of Griqualand West into the Cape Colony, he decided to run for one of the two seats representing the Barclay West constituency in the Cape Parliament in 1881. Because there was only one other person willing to campaign for a seat in Barclay West, Rhodes was duly elected unopposed as one of the two members. Once in Parliament, Rhodes used his position to campaign for new legislation that would suit the, mineral, the mine owners. He, along with fellow Griqualand West representative and mining magnate J.B. Robinson, pressed for a railway that would link Kimberley to Cape Town, as well as seeking measures to ensure both a constant supply of black African labor for the mines and greater control over black African workers once they had been recruited. 
They also demanded tough legislative laws in combating illicit diamond dealing, claiming that between a third and a half of all diamonds were being stolen and smuggled out of the mines by so-called illicit diamond buyers, or IDBs. Subsequently, in April 1882, Rhodes was appointed chairperson of a parliamentary committee to investigate the illicit diamond buyers. This led to the passing of the Diamond Trade Act of 1882, which contains some draconian provisions. For example, suspects of diamond theft were presumed guilty until proven innocent. Penalties were raised to include prison sentences of up to 15 years. Police were given powers to search without warrants and to engage in entrapment operations. Rhodes also have helped mine owners gain government approval for a new system of searching that affected both black and white workers. All workers below the rank of manager were required to pass through search houses on entering the, mine, the, on entering the mines and leaving them. Separate search houses were set up for black, African and white workers. Blacks were ordered to strip naked and were subjected to degrading body searches. Whites did not have to take off their clothes and underwent only a limited visual inspection. As well as helping to force workers into line, Rhodes used his political position to advance the interests of large mining companies like his own De Beers and weaken the smaller competitors. In 1883, he effected change in legislation that governed mining boards, awarding representation on mining boards on the basis of the size of the holding of the mining companies. This effectively gave control of the boards to large mining companies. Now, with control of the boards, large companies could determine what areas were given priority for reef removal work. This would lead to larger companies neglecting the areas owned by the smaller companies. Thus, the amendment change effectively meant the demise of the smaller competitors. In the case of De Beers, it used its power on the board to restrict water and reef removal to its own holdings only, thereby forcing many of its competitors into bankruptcy and buying their properties at bargain prices. Thus, Rhodes literally used his position in government to further his own business interests and that of his partners. But as was pointed out earlier, Rhodes' ambition did not stop with obtaining riches beyond his wildest dreams. Rhodes used that wealth and that of his business partner Alfred Bate and other investors to pursue his dream of creating a British Empire in new territories to the north by obtaining mineral concessions from the most powerful indigenous chiefs in the southern African interior. Rhodes' competitive advantage over other mineral prospecting companies was his combination of wealth and astute political instincts, also called the imperial factor. He befriended local British government representatives like uh, future British High Commissioner Hercules Robinson and through them organized British protectorates over the mineral concession areas through separate but related treaties. In this way he obtained both legality and security for mining operations. He could then attract more investors and thus according to Rhodes imperial in expansion and capital investment went hand in hand. However, for Rhodes, the imperial factor was a double-edged sword. He did not want the bureaucrats of the colonial office in London to interfere in the empire that he was busy building in Africa. He wanted British settlers and local politicians and governors to run it. This put him on a collision course with many in Britain as well as with British missionaries who favoured what they saw as the more ethical direct rule from London. Rhodes prevailed because he paid the cost of administering the territories in the southern African interior against his future mining profits. The colonial office did not have enough funding for this. Rhodes promoted his business interests as in the strategic interests of Britain, like preventing the Portuguese, the Germans or the Boer from moving into South Central Africa. For example, in 1883, Rhodes persuaded the British government to intervene in the Tswana territory of Bechuana land, or Botswana today, which was being harassed by Boer raids from the ZAR in the south and east 
as well as boot threats of annexation for the establishment of two short-lived republics there, Goshen and Stellarland. Rhodes claimed that the whole future of the Cape Colony was at stake by safeguarding Bechuana land from Boob hands. The so-called road to the north was according to Rhodes crucial in securing trade prospects with the rest of the African interior. Eventually a deal was concluded in February 1884 between the British government and President Kruger. Kruger agreed to a new borderline with Bechuana land taking a slice of Tswana territory but leaving the bulk of the Tswana territory intact. The deal gave Britain overall responsibility for administering the troubled southern half of Bechuana land, including the two republics of Stellarland and Goshen, thus securing the road to the north by making it a British protectorate. Now that Bechuana land was in friendly hands, Rhodes turned his gaze to the northwest. Since the discovery of gold on the Witwatersrand, Speculation was rife that even greater quantities of gold lay to the north in what was Zambezia, or parts of Zimbabwe and Zambia today. Both Rhodes and Kruger desired this land. The gateway to Zambezia, Matabele land in present day Zimbabwe, was controlled by the Ndebele king Lobengula. In 1887, on the orders of the High Commissioner of the Cape, Hercules Robinson, Rhodes sent John Moffat, son of missionary Robert Moffat, was trusted by Lobengula to persuade the latter to sign a treaty of friendship with Britain and to look favorably on Rhodes' proposals. Lobengula acknowledged Zambezia to be within Britain's sphere of interest and agreed to refrain from entering into any correspondence or treaty with any foreign state or power to sell, alienate or cede or permit or countenance any sale alienation or cession of the whole or any part of the said Amandabere country without the previous knowledge and sanction of Her Majesty's High Commissioner for South Africa. Britain acknowledged Rebengula as ruler not only of the Ndebele but also of the Shona. However, Rhodes not only wanted a British friendly African king, he also wanted that king to give him the complete mineral rights to his land. As explained in a letter to Schippard on 14 August 1888, Rhodes emphasized the importance of obtaining the rights to mine in Matabele land. If we get Matabele land, we shall get the balance of Africa. I do not stop in my ideas at the Zambezi. Rhodes's partner, Charles Rudd, together with Frank Thompson and Rockford Maguire, was sent to negotiate to, for mining concessions in Matabele land. On the 30th of October 1888, Lobengula signed the agreement document known as the Rudd Concession, thereby giving Rudd, Thompson and Maguire complete and exclusive charge over all metals and minerals situated and contained in his kingdoms, principalities and dominions together with full power to do all things that they may deem necessary to win and procure the same and to hold, collect and enjoy the profits of revenues from the said metals and minerals. In exchange, Rudd promised to pay Lobengula and his successors £100 a month and provide 1,000 rifles and 10,000 rounds of ammunition. However, the sale, of gift, the sale or gift of firearms to black Africans living outside of the Cape Colony was for all intents and purposes illegal in Cape law. But because of what was at stake, Robinson was persuaded by Rhodes to accept the clause. Rudd and Thompson also assured Lebengula that no more than 10 white men would mine in Matebele land. But in a cunning move, this limitation was purposefully left out of the Red Concession so the Indebele chief could not prove that it was part of the agreement. Lobengula tried to protest, but it was too late. Thus, the concession allowed full access for Rhodes and his associates to Matabele land. By this time, Rhodes had also formed the British South Africa Company, or BSA Company, an amalgamation of the two competing Central Search Association and the Exploring Company Limited. The BSA company's first directors included Rhodes and Bate. In 1889, 
the BSA company obtained a charter from the British government to build roads, railways and telegraphs, establish and authorize banking, award land grants, negotiate treaties, promulgate laws, maintain a company police force, the BSA police, and aid and promote immigration. In effect, the BSA company was a government unto its own, with roads as its head. Other concessions and treaties were obtained, were obtained north of the Zambezi, such as those in Barotsa land with the Lochner concession with King Lewanika in 1890, similar to the Rudd concession, and in the Lake Mweru area, 1890 Kazemba concession. Rhodes attempted to get a concession over mineral-rich Katanga, part of present-day Democratic Republic of the Congo, but its ruler Msiri resisted. However, in 1891, King Leopold II of Belgium obtained the concession of Katanga for his Congo Free State colony after the killing of Msiri. But this did not put Rhodes off from his grand imperial ambition. In fact, his ambition was about to grow exponentially. In 1890, at the age of 37, Rhodes became the Prime Minister of the Cape Colony. By doing so, he had achieved the pinnacle of wealth and power. He commanded an effective colonial administration, he controlled a virtual monopoly of the diamond production and the markets as chairperson of the beers. As managing director of the BSA company, he was empowered to act with absolute discretion over a vast stretch of the African interior and was in charge of a private army in the form of the BSA police to enforce his plans. However, for Rhodes, this was not enough. He was power hungry and thus craved for more power, more control. His attention turned back to the territory still outside of his control, the ZAR.